This is our land. We've lived on this land since time immemorial. Tonight, a Senate committee finds Indigenous peoples must be part of any climate change solution for the North. I can tell you one thing we need to do is build trust with the community. That's a big piece for me. Plus, a change in the guard with the RCMP in Nunavut comes with new hope. The story behind my ribbon skirt is the White Buffalo Calf Woman story. And it comes from a time in the 1900s when the people were struggling with famine. And the first place winner in a ribbon skirt competition explains the story behind her work. Good evening, Tanse Anin. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. A recent investigation launched by BC's Children and Youth Representative details a horrific case of abuse against two Indigenous children in care where one of the children died. The First Nations Leadership Council has called for the immediate resignation of Mitzi Dean, the Minister of Children and Family Development. And first, a warning that this story contains upsetting and graphic details. APTN's Tina House joins us now. I'm joined today by Grand Chief Stuart Phillip of the BC Indian Chiefs, who's also on the First Nations Leadership Council. Grand Chief, the council just recently called for the resignation of the BC Ministers of Children and Families. Why is that? It's because uh, this particular case is one of the most horrific uh, tragedies involving the death of a child in in memory in the province of British Columbia. It's absolutely horrible. These children were brutally beaten for a number of months. They were starved and they were forced to eat their own vomit and there was um, feces also. And I have never heard anything as um, you know, it's absolutely horrible in this particular case. Um, it's outrageous. There was uh, evidently no oversight, no regular checkups or anything of that nature, which is part of the responsibilities of the ministry. And now that it's become a public issue, uh, the so-called uh, parents, foster parents, received uh, 10 years um, in in jail, but in my mind, it should have been at least at least 25 years each for both of them. Yet it wasn't. So we're absolutely uh, outraged that there hasn't been uh, a very uh, severe, decisive response on the part of the ministry, on the part of government, and certainly on the part of the the justice system. It's been a complete colossal failure of defending the rights of children. Unacceptable. Grand Chief, I understand it was two siblings. One of them passed away, but the other one I'm sure deals with trauma every day from their experience. What can be done to overhaul this system that we're seeing with the BC Ministry of Children and Families in this province? Well, uh, the tragic reality is uh, uh, this isn't the first time we've had the tragic death of a child in care in British Columbia. And there's always the uh, commitments on the part of the new incoming minister that things will change, that policies will become more rigorous and there'll be greater oversight and so on and so forth, and yet that never materializes. It's the same laissez-faire, uh, negligent, uh, approach to child care at the expense and in this case um, the life of a young child. I have grandchildren the same age as these children so you can imagine you know how how angry and infuriated we are. Grand Chief, I know that the minister uh, did a, a Zoom call and responded to the calls for resignation. Uh, what are your thoughts on her answers there? It was um, deeply disappointing. It was frustrating. Uh, the minister continues to respond to all questions with the three speaking points that uh, she expressed to the mainstream media when this story first broke. Uh, basically, it's, it's a terrible tragedy. 
that these children were abused. She refuses to, to acknowledge that there was a death involved, the death of a child. And uh, she says, basically, we, we need to do better and we will do better. I mean, that's, um, you know, we ask, um, you know, what happened? You know, where did it go off the rails? And she absolutely refuses to answer those questions. Granchi, thank you so much for joining us today and our condolences to the family and the community in this terrible tragedy. Back to you in studio. APTN contacted Dean's office but did not receive a response. The minister posted a statement to the province's website that says, in part, I am heartbroken at what these children endured and I extend our deepest apologies and condolences to the family, friends and communities that have been impacted by this tragedy. And now to Manitoba, where new provisions for reporting serious injuries of children, youth and young adults involved in the child welfare system will take effect July 1st. The regulation will require service providers to report serious injuries to the Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth, or MACI. It applies to young people who are receiving or have received within one year any CFS, youth justice, mental health or addictions services. Macy will determine if an investigation is needed, and this will allow the advocate to track serious injuries through the first province-wide serious injury database. On Wednesday, Ottawa announced the membership of a committee whose job is to identify millions of unreleased residential school documents. The announcement was made at the Native Women's Association of Canada offices in Gatineau, Quebec. The six-person committee includes two people from Saskatchewan, two from Ontario, and one each from B.C. and Nunavut. Former Calisys First Nation Chief Cadmus DeLorme is the chairperson of the advisory committee. It will have four and a half years to file a report to the government. Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Mark Miller said there will still be some documents that will never be released. Often when we've asked to have all documents available, we butt up against some, uh, some decisions of the Supreme Court when it comes to the, the IAP documents, the individual testimonies that were given as part of uh, the Indian Residential School Settlement that, as the Supreme Court said, benefit from absolute uh, privacy, obviously because of uh, the context in which they were given. And well, a vote is underway this hour to determine the political future of the first woman national chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Chiefs and proxies have been meeting all day at an AFN Chiefs Special Assembly. The first resolution currently being voted on is to expel Roseanne Archibald as the national chief. This is the second attempt in the last year to remove Archibald as national chief, and we will bring you the latest as we get it. According to the Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Centre, 2023 has been the worst wildfire season in Canadian history. There are currently almost 500 active fires across the country, and some communities in Quebec and Manitoba are facing evacuations. There are 110 active fires in Quebec. Almost 1,200 people from Cree communities across the northern part of the province have fled their homes due to wildfires and smoke. The return of residents of Waswanapi and Ujibugamu will be decided Thursday. In northern Manitoba, the small community of Leaf Rapids declared a state of emergency. Lightning caused a bushfire last week and it's now grown to over 10,000 hectares in size. Around 300 residents have evacuated to nearby Thompson. Nunavut's newest top cop is hoping to build bridges between the RCMP and Inuit. Trevor Wright brings us this. Nunavut's newest commanding officer, Chief Superintendent Andrew Blackadar, was officially sworn in early June. One of his main goals is to, is to improve relations between the RCMP and Inuit. I can tell you one thing we need to do is build trust with the community. That's a big piece for me. That would be lasting change, is if uh, we could build a lot more trust between Nunavut and the RCMP. Blackadar says they are trying to bring more Inuit onto the force. With respect to our regular member recruiting, we are, we are trying very hard to bring more Inuk-speaking recruits into the RCMP 
and hopefully having them come back here to the territory to work. We have, um, I believe, six or seven Inuktitut speaking members of the RCMP in the territory, uh, hoping to increase that as we can recruit more. Supplementing this are two Inuktitut speaking OCC operators who answer emergency calls and related duties. Like regular members, this position requires extensive training. Despite ongoing efforts, recruitment is slow in a territory which has a sordid history with the RCMP. To build trust, Blackadar is looking to bring in 15 officers trained in community policing through the First Nations and Inuit policing program over the next few years. It's basically regular police officers that, that we have within the RCMP. Uh, they apply, they'll have to demonstrate that they're competent in, in uh, community and cultural profiles, that they have a desire to live and work in, in our smaller remote communities that they have a desire to work with the communities. It'll be a tripartite agreement involving the community. So what the program may look like in King 8 is gonna be different than the community in Arctic Bay. As part of the agreement, Nunavut RCMP will be reporting regularly to Public Safety Canada and the government of Nunavut. Blackadar hopes it'll help serve as a pipeline for Inuit recruitment. It's also a way, or I'm hoping that it will be a way to, um, to recruit more Inuit from the territory to, to join the RCMP. He adds it'll be a lot of work to be done for the RCMP to rebuild that trust. However, right now, there's nowhere to go but up. It's going to take us a long time to get to that ideal state, but at this point, the door's open, the RCMP is willing to, to learn, uh, willing to work with the community, and willing to make Nunavut a safer place to be. Trevor Wright, APTN National News, Iqaluit. All right, we have to step aside for just a moment, but stick around. We still have plenty more stories to come. Welcome back to APTN National News. A whooping cough outbreak has been declared in Manitoba's southern health region and the COVID-19 pandemic could be partly to blame. 154 confirmed or probable cases have been reported to date in Manitoba. All but two are from the southern region. The outbreak has resulted in 55 visits to emergency departments and two admissions to pediatric intensive care. No deaths luckily have been reported. Medical Health Officer Devinder Singh says most of the cases are affecting babies and children. While spikes in cases are expected every two to five years, this year is unusual. Uh, the number of cases that we're seeing is above even you know those those two to five year peaks that we would expect and so likely the the additional reason for that would um, potentially be the decrease in routine immunizations that we've seen with young children since um, the start of the pandemic Singh says whooping cough is most harmful for infants and pregnant women and advises anyone who hasn't been in immunized to get their shots New affordable rental units will soon be available for Métis living in Sault Ste. Marie. A ribbon cutting kicked off the new pilot project by the Métis Nation of Ontario. 20 new affordable housing units will be available over the next few months. The nation invested $7 million into the project. The new tenants will be prioritized according to their, situ their situations with rent starting at just over $1,000 per month. According to Regional Councillor Mitch Case, housing for Métis citizens in Sault Ste. Marie is needed now more than ever. 49% of the Métis citizens in the Sault Ste. Marie area uh, were dealing with some, some form of housing need. So either overcrowding, uh, unaffordability, uh, or, or you know, other, other challenges related to housing. And so as, as a response to that, that was the highest need uh, of any of our communities here in Ontario. A new Senate report says Canada's Arctic security is under threat. The report was released Wednesday morning in Ottawa. It says due to climate change and an unstable geopolitical environment, the Arctic area faces challenges not seen since the Cold War. It also says Indigenous peoples need to be part of any efforts to secure the area. 
Senator Margaret Dawn Anderson represents the Northwest Territories. They want to be an active participant. They want to be heard. Um, they want to know that, um, that they want Canada to know they're stewards of this land. They look after this land. This is our land. We've lived on this land since time immemorial. Indigenous athletes are just weeks away from the 2023 North American Indigenous Games. In the Western Arctic community of Inuvik, two teens are busy practicing and fundraising to join the Northwest Territories team for volleyball. Carly Jogner has this. It's the end of the school assembly and Matthew McLeod and Larry Sitichinli set up the nets to practice their serves. For the furthest they've traveled to represent their small Beaufort Delta community of a clavic. We heard about the nag trouts and it sounded exciting to go go out of town to do other stuff that we love. We always like to have like to play sports or go out on the land. Us were the only ones from the Beaufort Delta yeah. that were selected. It's pretty exciting. I never been traveled like right that far, Halifax, that would be the furthest I traveled. The Gwich'in and Inuvalut community of under 550 people, Eklavik is a two-hour commute to Inuvik through the winding channels of the Mackenzie River by boat or ice road or small airstrip. As many of the communities within the region, it becomes isolated during the spring and early winter during breakup and freeze up. Out of the 16 games featured at the North American Indigenous Games, the teens chose volleyball. It stuck out to me from the other sports. There's a lot of movement in the sport. Volleyball is probably one of my, probably close to my favorite sports because it's uh, active. A lot of people play it. Tournaments all happen, and and it's just just a fun game to play. For the outgoing Moose Curve School principal, who's offered to help with some coaching, he sees this as a long time coming because of their dedication. Matthew and, and Larry have worked very hard. They're, they're enthusiastic. They're, their character is, is shining all the time. They're very helpful. Um, they're at school every day. It's the attitude that makes the difference. And I think if they can combine that athleticism with their attitude, they're going to go a long way. With well over $1,000 for one flight to the NWT capital, the community steps up to help raise funds for them to go, including $800 to practice beforehand with the full NWT team in Yellowknife. It's good to see them, good youth, have that chance to participate in activities like this. And, you know, keep doing what you're doing, you know, keeping yourself, you know, keep presenting your cultures and your values out there and you know it's, it's gonna go a long ways. The teens say they find well-being through sports and being out on the land and it's paying off as for Matthew's spring regional skidoo race placings and feature in a studio album to be released at the end of the month of the song named after the community's motto never say die. It's a small community so it always try to find places to go or something to do around here. We'd always be with our friends. Don't let other people bring you down when you're trying to do new things, like different sports that you're trying to get better at. Just cancel them out of your thoughts and do your best at what you're doing. Volleyball tournaments start in Halifax on July 17th. Carly Schogner, APTN National News, McClavick. It's a great story there, and we certainly cannot wait for NAG to get underway. All right, it's time to pause one final time here. We have our photo of the day and weather coming up. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Under the sky of a setting sun, Gil Gilbert sent in this shot of a 30-foot teepee located at the Bannock and Bed Inn at, at the Sucker Creek First Nation in Alberta. 
Gail tells us the teepee is used for retreat meetings and workshops. It's a great photo there, Gail. If you think you have a photo that should be the next photo of the day, you can send your photos to share at aptn.ca. All right, now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. We begin on the East Coast. Rain in 25 in St. John's and 24 in Charlottetown. 17 in Cartwright and 21 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Some showers in 23 in Quebec City and 22 in showers in Montreal. Clear and 26 in North Bay and 22 in Sault Ste. Marie. 17 degrees in showers in Wawa and 22 and some rain in Sioux Lookout. Mix of sun and cloud in 26 in Churchill and 28 in Thompson. Rain in 22 in Barron's River and rain in 23 in Winnipeg. Mix of sun and cloud and 25 in Yorkton and 26 in Saskatoon. 29 in rain in Buffalo Narrows and 32 in rain in Stony Rapids. As we continue west, the rain in 31 in Fort Chippewa and rain in 26 in Peace River. Rain in 29 in Edmonton and rain in 30 in Calgary. 23 degrees in Vancouver and 20 in Bella Coola. Showers in 16 in Prince Rupert and showers in 25 in Fort Nelson. 20 degrees in Whitehorse and 23 in Old Crow. 29 in Norman Wells and 25 in Fort Simpson. Clear in 30 in Fort McPherson and 29 in Inuvik. 15 degrees in Cambridge Bay and 13 in Clear in Chesterfield. 6 degrees in Arctic Bay and 9 in Iqaluit. Dan Paul, a Mi'kmaq elder, author and human rights activist, has died at the age of 84. Paul was author of We Were Not the Savages, which revealed that brutal colonial government tactics were responsible for the decline of Mi'kmaq people. His work made a huge impact, most recently on naming practices in Nova Scotia, where the province's first governor, Edward Cornwallis, was often honored despite his policy that offered bounty awards for Mi'kmaq scalps. Our hearts are certainly with his family and the entire Mi'kmaq community. A ribbon skirt masters competition was held in Saskatoon as part of Indigenous Month. Indigenous First Designs coordinated the event in honor of the Indigenous History Month. Competitors displayed their work and local elders judged the competition. It was an opportunity to highlight their craft and culture. Taylor Tatusis, a ribbon skirt designer, won first place and says each skirt she designs has a personal story. The story behind my ribbon skirt is the White Buffalo Calf Woman story. And it comes from a time in the 1900s when the people were struggling with famine and not being able to have a lot of what they needed. Their resources were slim and they couldn't find any buffalo. So they sent out two scouts. Those scouts that were sent out looking for buffalo came upon a woman. And that woman was beautiful. She had long, long black hair. She was had a buffalo robe on her. Now all the ribbon skirts in the competition are up for auction on the Indigenous First Designs Facebook page to raise money for the Saskatoon Food Bank and the Saskatoon Learning Centre. And the bidding for that closes June 29th. All right, that is all we have for you this evening on APT National News. Our website, aptnews.ca, has you covered if you'd like any more information on any of our stories from tonight. For all of us here, thank you so much for joining us. Miigwech, Kinnan Askerton, and have a wonderful night.